everyone, I'm here at the Lost Coast in Northern California, and in this video, I'm gonna show you what the hike is like. Now, this isn't a hike where you can just show up, you need a permit, you usually need a shuttle, you have to time it right for the tides, and people usually take two to four days to do this. If you go to hikingguy.com, I have a full corresponding article where I'll talk about itineraries, getting around the tides, getting a permit, and all of the logistical stuff. So check that, uh, check that out before you head out here. But in this video, I'm gonna show you what the hike is like, what you can expect when you're out on the trail. Now, if you're liking the video, if you can give me a little thumbs up, I appreciate that, that helps me out a ton. And thank you, thank you, thank you for watching the video, supporting the channel, and all of your help, everyone. I could not do this without you, so thank you for that. All right, let me uh, show you this fun, fun, bucket list worthy hike. Now, before we dive in here, let me just give you a little note and an overview. I'm going to cover in this guide uh, the Lost Coast Trail from Atoll Trailhead, which is up here, all the way down to Shelter Cove. Now, there are over 50 miles of Lost Coast Trail, and you can do other parts of it, including the south part down here. <laughs> But the classic part, the most popular part, the part that's hard to get uh, permits for is this north part from the Toll Trailhead down here to Shelter Cove, which is about 25 miles or so. And if you book a guided tour, like where you're going with them and they're handling the camping and the guiding, this is always the route that they're gonna take. So that's what I'm gonna cover in this guide. Now you can see we go from here from a toll all the way down to Shelter Cove. There are three tidal zones. One is up here by Punta Gorda. This is a short one. It's really only a point, but you want to give yourself a little bit of room there. And the other two ones, which are marked in red, are about four miles each. I have all of this data on the guide, on Hiking Guy, as well as the GPX file, so you can download this to your phone or GPS device and have all this information in here. You can see there's quite a bit of places to camp. All of the campsites have running water where you can drink water. And before I dive into the actual video, one other note, uh, most people take a a uh, shuttle from Shelter Cove up to Matol and then hike back down to Shelter Cove. The straight line between these two places is about 22 miles, but if you drive, even on the shuttle, it's about a two hour drive up through here on these small roads of the King Range National Conservation Area. So if you check out the guide on Hiking Guy, I'll talk all about the shuttles, planning this, when to hit these tides, and uh, what airports to fly into, the gear that you're gonna need, what to expect on the trail. All of those details will be in the guide, but otherwise, let me show you what the actual hike looks like uh, from the hiker's point of view. So let's dive in. All right, so here we are at Matol Beach, and there's a campground here if you wanna camp overnight. And the trailhead is right here at the end of the parking lot. I'm gonna go through this little gate and in the most simple terms, we're basically going to go to the ocean, make a left, and hike until we get to Shelter Cove. But the reality is there's some twists and turns along the way that you're going to need to be aware of. And you can see right away, it's a beautiful, beautiful beach hike. Here's some people have built uh, shelters. Now, Matol Beach, you can drive to. It's a tough drive, but you can. And one thing to note, if you do see shelters like this, sometimes you can camp around them, but usually there are some rodents there and even sometimes rattlesnakes. So just heads up at that. As we go south, you can see here we are on this pristine coastline, walking south. We're gonna cross one of these little creeks here. Now there's a bunch of different creek and river crossings. The named rivers and creeks almost always uh, run for the entire year. And there's a bunch of unnamed ones that are a little more sketchy but there's always places to get water so you don't really have to carry a lot of water with you now you can see the slopes start to go up a little bit now i'm doing this at low tide you can imagine what this is going to be like at high tide so you definitely want to top you know time this correctly and here we're going to pass through the first tidal zone you can see the pinch point up there where it definitely gets a little bit narrow but then once you come around that, it gets wide again, and that's the end of the first tidal zone. Now, walking in the sand is a lot tougher than walking on the trail. It's uh, obvious, but you know, worth mentioning as we go because you will have a backpack on. There are some private cabins when this became a national conservation area in the 70s. Some of the private landowners uh, held out and they kept the property here. So there's some of these really remote cabins along the way. Now here's Four Mile Creek. This is the first of the named creeks along the way. It's right by the cabin there. 
What a beautiful cabin, but we're gonna go ahead and cross this. Having trekking poles helps. The ground can be really slippery once you get on those rocks, so just a heads up. Here's a trail sign, LCT, Lost Coast Trail. And we're actually going up onto the bluff here. And this is gonna be the, basically the dynamic for the entire hike. You're either gonna be hiking on the beach or you're gonna be up on the bluffs behind the beach like this. Now these parts of the hike are much easier. Obviously you can see the trail is pretty easy to follow and it's all hard packed. It's not like walking in the beach sands that we had uh, earlier. Here's the Punta Gorda Lighthouse, built in 1911, closed in 1951, and uh, it's a fun little place to stop. Some people have lunch or take a break here, but you can explore the lighthouse and climb up to the top, or you can keep on going. Um, right after that, we're gonna cross Willow Creek. Now, this is another type of creek crossing. Some of them go inland a little bit, and you'll have to kind of go around the creek. You can also see there's some poison oak here. There are poison oak and ticks, and I'll talk about all the hazards and what to do about them in the guide on hiking guy. Now from there, we're basically gonna be hiking on the bluffs until we get up to Sea Lion Gulch. And you can see we're right by the beach and you don't really have to worry about the tides or the incoming tides at this point. This might be one of my favorite parts of the hike where we climb up a little bit. There's no real big climbing on this, this hike or backpacking trip. When you climb up, uh, whatever, 100 feet or so, you can get some beautiful views down the coast and of the ocean. Now, this is Sea Lion Rock by Sea Lion Gulch. If you end up camping at Sea Lion Gulch, which is right before the first tidal zone, uh, the sea lions are usually pretty loud on that rock. Not too bad if you can sleep well during the night, but if you're a light sleeper, you might have a problem here at Sea Lion Gulch. And it's right after we come over this rise and you look down and you will see the campsites or the tent sites for Sea Lion Gulch. There are some people set up right there. And this is uh, kind of atypical. It's a little bit up on a bluff, but the, the campsites and the tent sites on the Lost Coast Trail are basically just tent sites. There's no bathrooms or anything. Now after Sea Lion Gulch, we're gonna go down and um, cross through the creek here, and then we're gonna enter the probably the toughest tidal zone that there is. It's tough for a few reasons. The first being these huge rocks, which are called the cobbles. Um, there's rocks from all different sizes on this hike, you know, from a few inches to maybe a few feet across that you will have to hop across as you hike. And it's tough, it requires concentration, especially if these rocks are wet. It's, uh, you know, it's something that if you normally maybe backpack at two and a half miles an hour, you're probably gonna go about a, a mile, a mile and a half uh, through the section. So just a heads up here and when you're planning. And this whole section has a bunch of them. There's also some of these bigger boulders that we're gonna have to navigate around that you can see would be tricky if the tide is up. Again, the tide is out here. The rule of thumb is you want the tide to be below three feet as you go. Now, when you go a little further past that boulder, you're gonna look up to the left and you're gonna go up a gulch and a gully. And you can see here on the satellite map, if we go up here, you're gonna go up on the bluff here to pass basically a rock that fell a while ago now, but it is a boulder scramble over there that is considered impassable at all times uh, by the Bureau of Land Management who runs this. They want you to go up and around the bluff. So just climb up there and then come on back down to the big old cobbles and make your way across. Now you can see it's not uh, super, super wide here, but it is doable. And then here's the Cooksey Creek campground. Now the tidal zones do have campgrounds in them that are set back from the tidal zone. So if you get caught in the tidal zone, you can go to a campground like Cooksey and uh, basically take refuge or you can camp there, let the tide come up and then let the tide go down and leave in the morning. So either way, here you can see the beach is mellowed out. Really incredible rock formations and erosion here. It's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful, beautiful place. And the mountains here actually, they go up about an inch every 20 years. It's one of the newest mountain ranges around. Now you can see some of the pinch points in the distance. You can see where it gets narrow there. Those are pinch points. So when the tide is up, you might have to walk through the water. You always wanna be looking at the water as you go. When you get to Randall Creek, 
we're going to be at the end of the first tidal zone. And a lot of people will take a break there. And from here, the, the trail mellows out. But you can see from my hiking companion in front of me there, even though the rocks are small, it is still kind of a tough going on this terrain here. You can't just cruise along like you could on a, like a flat like this, which is the next sort of landmark is Spanish Flat. Now we're back up on the bluffs and we're just cruising on this trail. The trails to get up and down from the bluffs are usually easy to spot. They kind of change every time I, I see them. So uh, I'm not putting them in there because they might look different than when you're here, but you could see you, people can walk on the beach or up on the bluff. But if you walk up on the bluff, it's much easier uh, going, especially with the backpack on than walking on the soft sand. You can see it can get a little bit overgrown and sometimes the trail will split apart and come back together, but it's definitely there and uh, definitely navigable. Here's an unmarked campsite with some wood shelters. The rangers will rip these down. Uh, they might leave the fire rings, but they'll generally rip these down because, uh, you know, here we practice leave no trace principle. So you really shouldn't be building those unless there's maybe a need to do it. Here's a marker. There are some trails that go up into the hills and across the King Range. If you ever needed to bail out, there's about a half dozen of those types of trails. Sometimes bad weather will just make this hike not doable. And in that case, you're just going to go back up one of those trails and just kind of hitchhike out of here. And you can see there's some pine trees on the hills here, but this is a really easy stretch. You're kind of probably in or away from the ocean the most out of all of the uh, stretches. We're going to cross over Spanish Creek. And again, this is one of those creeks we're going to go upstream a little bit and then cross over it and come back around. There's also a split in the trail here. Uh, there are several of these along the way. There are private cabins off to the left, and that road will go to the private cabin. So it will, the trail will basically be routed. There's the cabin. It will be routed around that land so we can give the private uh, landowners some respect. But we're just going to go back around it, and then we're going to pop back on after the cabin. And here we are on the trail. And it goes without saying, you're not going to want to camp on the private lands. Just pick a different uh, place. Past that is the Kinsey Ridge Trail, which goes up and over the mountain. And again, that's another place where you can bail out if you need to. You can see some fire damage up on the hill there. Make sure you check the uh, website for the park beforehand. Sometimes they do uh, close this off to any type of open campfire because it's obviously easy to start a fire when the wind's blowing off the ocean and the conditions are dry. So check that out. Put a link to that on the guide. Here we have another private cabin and we're going to get routed back down to the beach here. Now the beach is definitely easier than it was earlier. It's more of a uh, just walking on the sand type thing. Hopefully the conditions are good. And past Spanish Flat is Kinsey Creek. Now all of these creeks offer tent sites. So, uh, you know, people ask me what my favorite is. They're all pretty good. I've never gone wrong with a campsite here on the Lost Coast Trail. We're going to continue down along the beach and you can see how the waves come up. Rule of thumb is never turn your back on the ocean. There are sneaker waves, which are kind of like rogue waves that will come up occasionally and douse you, could pull you out. Here's a baby snake. There are rattlesnakes here. Uh, generally, you don't see many of them. Uh, they'll be, you know, on the in the driftwood or hiding out in the shade sometimes. So just keep your eyes open. Now here we are on Big Flat. We're back away from the ocean. And this is probably the farthest we're going to get away from the ocean at any point. And we're not that far. You could see after a little climb up here, you could see all of Big Flat off in the distance right there. Big Flat's actually a pretty popular spot for surfers and you will get surfers hiking up here. And you'll occasion, occasionally see them here. Now the trail at this point is actually uh, doubling as a runway. There's a private cabin off to the left and there's a windsock here on Plains land. There's the cabin. Cabin's a strong word. It's a really nice house. I've heard that a, uh, people use it for retreats. There's disc golf there and uh, other types of things go on. And I'll talk about that a little bit on the guide, a little bit of the history and the context of the area. But after that cabin, we're going to come to Rattlesnake Ridge Junction. Again, another one of those bailout trails. And those bailout trails are very primitive. Um, it's not anything like this. It's a lot tougher to hike, so just a heads up if you want to do that. 
We make the right at Rattlesnake Ridge, continue across the flat, look up, there's King Peak again in the distance. And we're gonna continue on through here. This is a really popular spot for camping and you can see some of the surfers here have made little artwork with some whale bones. It's really a cool spot all around, flat and lots of water, not a problem. And this is Flat Creek, which is the start of Miller Flat, which is across from there. There's also a residence uh, deer population here, but this is probably one of the more popular campsites. And it does offer a lot of different places where you can duck out of the wind, which can be a thing at night. Now here we are, we're crossing Miller Flat once across the creek and we're heading towards the uh, second or the last tidal zone. And you can see we're up on the bluff and the beach is getting a little bit narrower and we're gonna be spit down onto the beach here. You can see somebody has marked this with a cairn. And again, these little ingresses and egresses from the beach kind of change and they obviously get blown around by the conditions and the wind and the weather. So just keep your eyes open and have some electronic navigation, but we're gonna go down. And now we're in Tidal Zone 3. Now, while this can be challenging, I don't find it as hard as Tidal Zone 2. There are some pinch points like this one here where it'll be narrow, but generally these rocks are smaller rocks. There's not, not a lot of the big cobbles around here, so it's a little bit easier going. But there are some pinch points, and I've marked these pinch points in the GPX file and you can bring that with you so you know what to expect. But you can imagine if the tide was up, you would be underwater at this point. When you come around, you'll be able to see Shelter Cove in the distance. That's where the hike ends, where that arrow was. Here's Shipman Creek. This is one of the campsites that's in the tidal zone or the impassable tidal zone. So if you wanted to bail out or you just want to camp here and have the tide come up at night, you can do that and you would be safe in there. But otherwise, we're going to continue on. You can see it's a little more, it's narrow, but it's a little more mellow. There's more sand as we go here. And then we're going to pass Buck Creek. And also, let me just let you know that the conditions in this video are ideal. It definitely gets much worse than this. You can have storm surges, you can have king tides, and, you know, the water can be way up and it could be pretty crazy. Here's what I think is a giant Pacific octopus. We stretched this thing out and it was about, I don't know, 15 feet across, pretty massive, but it had just washed up from the ocean there and it was, it was dead, but you'll see a lot of different things. Sometimes you see whales out in the ocean. This is Gitchell Creek. And one thing about the wildlife, and I'll talk about this in the guide too, if there are seals on the beach laying around, they look like these logs. They're the same color as logs. So just be careful as you hike and uh, watch out for them. Here you can see the creek is actually going under the rocks and coming out the other side. Pretty, pretty neat. Now this point, we're um, basically coming out of the tidal zone and here's Horse Mountain Creek, one of the last campsites before we reach Shelter Cove. And you can see at this point, the beach is definitely wider and really we're just doing a long beach walk now on sand. There's some of these huge boulders that have rolled down. This area is at the convergence of three tectonic plates, which is part of the reason why the geology and the topography is so interesting. But we're gonna go through these boulders and this is sort of the last landmark before we get to the end up ahead. You can see Shelter Cove is straight ahead there beach is nice and wide, easy to walk. And then here are the houses in Shelter Cove. We're basically going to aim for that house right in the middle of the picture here up on the hill. That's where the exit from the beach is for this section. And here you can see the, the road and the trailhead is up on that little bluff on the left hand side. We're going to go up along the creek here and you'll see a trail, a little, a little bit hidden, but it'll wind up. You walk up say your goodbyes to the ocean at this point look how beautiful that is and then you're just going to wind it around you're going to find the other trailhead the black sands beach trailhead and this is the trail board but the actual parking area is just up the paved road just a minute or two you just walk up and you'll see a sign for this this is probably where you've parked or got the shuttle from and you're just going to go up and around and you're back at the start and that is the hike Lost Coast Trail.